Welcome back everyone to Sparks 18. We are really excited to be here with Chris Irizarry to rehash, I guess, some of the key components and ask the questions that you have asked about his talk covering canine behavioural genetics. But first, importantly, we need to say a big thank you to everyone who came to the call and showed us photos of their animals watching Sparks 18 live. So far, we've probably only got about a third of the photos that we received shown here because we had to get them up and put together, but it's really, really lovely and we've really enjoyed getting to see and meet uh, your animals that are interacting with us uh, over the, the social media. And I wanted to thank the birds yeah. for really taking notice of the gene plus environment <laughs> equals phenotype. That was awesome. Thank you to them. Hopefully the dogs got that too. But <laughs> the birds, the birds. Really it went right to the birds. It went right to the it's birds. It's just the best kind of conference, isn't it? This when is you awesome. Get this yeah. Yeah. Live, happening yeah. straight away. We really feel connected to everyone who is yeah. watching. So speaking of that, some of the dogs on the internet are having an identity crisis um, one said oh no I thought I was 18% corgi um, so what am I or who am I so if the question is what is the value in knowing these mixed breed compositions what are your thoughts on that um, you know I I think that they're good if you have a dog and you're curious what their ancestry was you know, I look at them, and I don't mean any disrespect to the companies that make it, because I've paid for them myself on my dogs and my friends' dogs, and we talk about it. But I mean, you know, it's, in my opinion, more of like a horoscope or a Chinese fortune, you know? I mean, you'll read the fortune, you'll be like, oh, okay, next week, or a, a horoscope, oh, wow, July's my month. But no one's like going to take that as like a reason why you should not get a job, because it says Sagittarius is going to have a bad month, and that's the month <laughs> of your interview. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. Are you Sagittarius? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. There might be some Sagittarius out there. I'm, Hopefully, I am. It was a job. joke. It was just a joke. I am. Oh, are you? <laughs> yeah, so it's good. On the okay. cusp. Oh, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, we did have a question from Renee via Twitter. And Renee was interested in knowing about, I guess, the genetic impact on dogs' capacity for resilience. So particularly looking at a situation where perhaps some under-socialized dogs from a cruelty case kind of environment um, have come out of that and displayed confident social behavior when they've moved to a more normal um, setting, but other dogs that have come from the same gene pool and the same situation aren't able to cope very well and make that transition. So sort of, I guess, what are your thoughts on what's underpinning those differences? Um, genes plus environment equals phenotype. That's my answer. I don't know. I don't know what the phenotype was, what the environment was. I don't know. You know, it's complicated. I think there have been some studies in humans looking at resilience, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, there have been genes that have been implicated at giving people buffering capacity for dealing with stress, and I'm sure that there are ways that dogs could be further selected. I think that, you know, some of the working dogs are selected to be more impervious to uh, distraction. But um, I feel sorry for any dogs that have had a bad life, and I think it's really sad that some dogs have been in situations where they can't come out and find a new home. Mm -hmm. um, I think more research needs to be done, and that's a really important area that we should be focusing on because I think all these dogs deserve second chances. Absolutely. Um, I was really curious, I guess, to ask you a little bit more about what you think the significance is that... Um, I guess more than just a reduction of fear underlies the domestication of dogs. Like, do you feel there's more to it? Oh, there's a tremendous more to it. Um, you know, uh, just to get into a, a little bit more background, you know, it's 30,000 years is a long time. And, you know, we, we talk about it like it's no big deal. But, you know, we live, what, like, if we're lucky, 100 years with our family. And... 30,000 years is so much longer. I mean, the, the interconnectedness between dogs and humans is like the strongest cross-species bond probably af after parasitism because that's probably been going on longer. <laughs> yeah, true. But it's probably like the strongest <laughs> beneficial bond ever in the history of this planet. And um, what it tells me is that dogs are worth way more than the dollars we spend for them and that the neurological and psychological bonds between humans and dogs are real, and that there is a um, compensatory, if you will, connection that the dogs 
love and compassion and desire to be with its, with its family is just as strong as a human's desire to be with their children. And that in cases where people lose dogs, it's a tremendous loss. Breaking of the human-animal bond is significant, and some people can be thrust into depression over it. And as we mentioned earlier, some people want to clone their dog to get it back. I think that we're just now beginning to use science to understand what we've already known, that we love our animals with all our heart. And now that science is confirming that that human-animal bond is something tangible that can be characterized and, um, and looked at and, and beginning to be defined at the genetic level just lends credibility to the idea that they're our best friend. Um, so with, with that in mind, is there some kind of nugget that you wish that the dog-owning only, dog only public really took away and understood um, about this topic? Um, I think the dog owning public already understands it. <clears throat> I, I think people who don't own dogs and are fearful of dogs or have misguided perceptions of a dog that has a certain appearance or they hear that a dog is um, one-third border collie and they have these visions in their head that it's going to do something, that's just all misplaced. And I mean, I'm... I'm legitimately and honestly like disappointed and sad when people have these misconstrued ideas about genetics and breed and dogs because I, I just feel um, the sorrow that people feel when they have to lose their dogs or when someone wants to take someone's pet away. As part of my own research into this, I looked into um, the impact of loss of pet life on pet owners <clears throat> and I came across some pretty grim stuff. I mean, in, in looking up this information, I started looking at papers that described like the, the psychological impact on owners when they lose their pets. And what I found was that the impact is much greater when it's unexpected. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. tremendous when it's at their own hands or they believe it is. If someone left a gate open, the dog's hit mm -hmm. by a car. Mm -hmm. There's papers on end of life when a terminally ill dog has to be euthanized, mm -hmm. and that's very hard. And that is not as bad as if a dog is confiscated for having never done anything wrong mm -hmm. simply because the shadow it casts is roughly the same contour mm -hmm. of a dog that may have done something inappropriate in the past. Ultimately, um, I wish people would look at an individual dog and not try and group dogs into some larger group unless the group is these are our best friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you think, um, I guess we, our perception of breeds, <laughs> that's how I feel I need to describe mm -hmm, it today, mm -hmm. or, or, or with breeds, mm -hmm. um, do you think the human-animal attachment that you're sort of touching on is stronger for some breeds? No, I think that all of those, all of the breeds that we have today <clears throat> came from that initial population bottleneck out of wolves, and the selection that occurred to produce the pool of, of domesticated canids that ultimately became the breeds we have today all shared that selection. And because of that, there is no breed that's any less capable of having a bond and being a companion animal and mm -hmm. being a member of our families. And people who say otherwise, unfortunately, I think they're just missing some of the key pieces of information. And, um, you know, uh, when, when there is a tragedy and, and a dog is involved in an, um, in an event with a human that ends up causing a person to get hurt, I wish that we could look at that as an individual event and not extrapolate to all dogs with four legs mm -hmm. because that's too big of a circle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've got a question now that's kind of got a few parts to it or we can look at it in a staged way, I guess, which is that you mentioned earlier you've had some surprises since starting, I guess, research in the area of genetics and that some questions weren't necessarily as easy to answer as expected and quite often, as is the way in science, they've led to lots of other questions. I'm curious, I guess, where you see the field of canine behavioral genetics heading um, over the next short term, medium term, long term. So let's say the next five years, the next 10 years, and looking ahead to maybe the next 20 years. Um, where do you think we're going to go next? It's very interesting. I think um, I'm intrigued at designer dogs. That's kind of got me intrigued because, you know, for a long time, there was a lot of uh, social frowning on crossing dogs outside of breeds, which <clears throat> I had a dog in a particular breed, and I was going to join the breed association, and then it's, I had a sign agreeing I would never cross it with another breed. And I didn't want to cross it, but I thought if I could extend the progeny's lifespan by six years for a dog that had a nine-year lifespan, I would be very tempted to do so. 
But I, did, I didn't sign it because I didn't want to be untruthful. But I think that we have a very unique opportunity to continue the uh, artificial selection of dogs. I don't think we're done. And I think it would be incredible to see what, what comes out of our relationship with dogs over the next 100, 200, 500, and 1,000 years. I mean, it's going to be incredible. I'm, I bet you we'll end up getting things that we didn't even think were possible. We'll have dogs with such unique traits. Maybe there'll be a more high-resolution stratification and more finely tuned dogs for specific applications, or maybe you can get dogs that are perfect fits for different personality types in humans. And so depending on a person's predisposition or preference for lifestyle, you could have dogs that thrive under that lifestyle. And so you don't get as many mismatches of dogs and people. Maybe that's an outcome that we could get. I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Okay. I just have a bit of a moment. Yeah. Do you think there's, there's room? So I guess one of the things we've seen in primary production is developing animals that are better able to cope in the conditions in which we keep them in order to be able to generate uh, meat or you know um, other products that we like to consume. Um, and we've made tweaks to those animals to allow them to enjoy a better level of welfare or be less susceptible to feeling pain or experiencing discomfort. Um, do you see, you know, like, is there room for the, the future dog that actually isn't interested in exercising is really just a soft, squishy thing that we pat and keep in the apartment because we like them to need us, but we don't actually have the time to take care of all their needs? I think computers will fix that. We'll have dog robots that you don't have to pay attention to, but I think dogs need to be a big part of our lives. And every time I see a dog hanging out of a window of a car, it puts a huge smile on my face because those dogs have awesome lives. Um, I think it's possible that you can get dogs to a point where in society as we run up against more population explosion and less space per family, we can end up producing dogs that are more adept at thriving and maintaining a positive life experience in an environment that their ancestors may not have been able to thrive in. But um, I hope that uh, if people want fuzzy animal pillows, that they buy pillows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that's, that's, that's kind of the thing, though, isn't it? Because it's, it's something that we see is this mis mismatch between what we want, which is a dog that needs us, because psychologically we love to feel that we're caregiving mm -hmm. and that we're needed. But the flip side of that is when we go out to work for 10 hours a day, we have a dog that then suffers separation anxiety and experiences frustration with our absence. So it's, I guess, how do we reconcile and, and where can behavioural genetics perhaps help in that regard in, in getting those needs for both parties closer aligned? That's a question that's very, very dear to my heart because when I look at traits like approach and avoidance or um, anxiety or um, extroversion, what you find is that as you push and pull those, those levers, the consequences are sometimes not what you expect. Mm. And if your dog has separation anxiety while you're gone, and you breed a dog that doesn't have separation anxiety while you're gone, it may not have love while you're present. I don't know. I'm not, I, I feel bad for dogs that suffer from separation anxiety. But there's definitely enough time and space for people to breed dogs, and there may be dogs that are less destructive to our households. I think that dogs get themselves in trouble by missing their owners and family members so much that they end up losing their family because the owners can't deal with the mm. consequences. So it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. But um, <clears throat> I think that it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned in my life is whenever I thought the answer was simple, I just <laughs> learned that I didn't know anything. <laughs> so I'll just say it's complicated. Well, that's yeah. why we have a panel discussion today. Yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to talk a bit more about yeah. that? Yes. So quite soon, um, around 4.30 Eastern Daylight Time, we are going to have a panel discussion with uh, most of the speakers that will be joining us over the next three days, yourself included. Um, and we will be from 4.30 to 5.15 chatting with everybody else. So we'll bring the conversation a bit, a bit wider. And we've got some of the questions that you've submitted that we'll be able to bring up with input from all of our speakers. And uh, I guess just some other topics that we'd like to lay out on the table. We definitely encourage healthy scientific debate and mm -hmm. discussion. Um, there may be some conflicting viewpoints on some topics, which is generally quite popular with the viewing mm -hmm. um, audience. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how that goes. And yeah. we look forward to catching up with you again really soon after the break. <laughs>